Oh, hey everybody. It's me, James, and today I am going to be talking to Leslie Mitchell Clark. I say Mitchell very slowly because I think I called her Leslie Michael Clark. Leslie Mitchell Clark, she is a hypnotherapist out of Toronto, Ontario. Actually, she's originally from New York, and it's not about hypnotherapy per se. What, but that's what she does. In her practice, she actually will take people back and recover some of missing memory or clarify some things into possible ET contact. Very interesting. Our friend Skeeter Wellhouse does the same thing at some conferences. And we talk about how she has kind of got into that belief that extraterrestrials actually exist. We talk about things like the Parallel Space Program. We talk about her book, Intersections, a true story of extraterrestrial contact what about a guy named west roberts and some of the stuff that he ran into and we talk about her own experiences around people who have uh, bumped into ets and such so leslie mitchell clark is here to uh, explain to us or not really explain to us because that would take way too long uh, to talk to us about how her hypnotherapeutic regression into some of these memories of extraterrestrial experiencers works and some of the findings that she's found find findings that she's found some of the things she's bumped into so leslie mitchell clark is a toronto-based certified hypnotherapist who specializes in a number of modalities it this includes working with individuals who feel like i said have had experiences with extraterrestrial beings most of this fascinating work as well as her metaphysical therapies such as past life regressions Interlife regressions all take place in Leslie's Toronto Hypnosis Clinic, the Lightwork Hypnosis. Now go to her website, Lightwork Hypnosis. If you think you've had kind of one of these experiences or have an experience you can't quite put your finger on and think maybe you did bump into something or maybe you did have an experience as a kid, lightworkhypnosis.com check out her website and see if there's something in there that you can relate to and maybe give her a call. Now, prior to her work in hypnotherapy, Leslie has had a busy career as an actor, dancer, vocalist, and for the past 20 plus years, she's also been a top jazz and arts media consultant with an array of Grammy and Juno winning clients, as well as major jazz festivals and record labels. Uh, she is currently the director of LMC Media with offices in both Toronto and Leslie's hometown of New York. Uh, she's a busy arts writer, uh, contributing regularly to a variety of publications all over the place. And uh, she's here to tell us a little bit about the extraterrestrial side of her work, which is very, very cool. I'm going to get our little extraterrestrial friend, Liam, to introduce the show. And uh, after that, we're going to bounce in with Leslie Mitchell Clark. Hang tough. Liam? I see you found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with experience that's out of this world. Or possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world, each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam. Hey, and thank you, everyone, for dropping by this episode slash whatever this is. I guess it's an episode. And with me today is, sorry, they, I sometimes, it throws me off being on video or, or actually recording these things on video and doing the audio one. So it's like, yeah, an episode is an episode. So yeah, it's it's just one of those things. With me today is Leslie Michelle Clark. Uh, I said Michelle. It's Leslie Mitchell. It's all Clark. right. It's all right. <laughs> Leslie Mitchell 
uh, who my friend Michelle actually got me to talk to. Indeed. Uh, and just so you don't feel too bad, Mitchell is simply a medieval version of Michelle. We first show up at the Norman Conquest. So actually, Michelle is probably much more accurate than the 15th century Mitchell, which is a harder sound and not I, so cool. I have some ancestry who were Norman. Mm. So they would have been hanging out there when they when they crossed the uh, the channel. Yeah, and well, they are us. They are us. We they are we, us. we split. We hung out in Normandy. We came back. That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> they are so us. It's, it's my my <laughs> my mother's side of the family too. Their last name was Center with an S. Ah. And, and then when they arrived in in 1620. For, I think one of them died in 1628 in Massachusetts. They changed it to start with a C when they got to the Americas mm. or mm -hmm. the, the colonies or whatever it was in 1620 in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, I guess it was the colony, wasn't it? It was the it was the, the, it, was colony, the yeah. it was the colonies. They, it was the British colonies in Massachusetts. Yeah. So, a little farther up, it right only a couple hundred miles, it would have been New France. Yes, in in Canada, which borders Maine, what we now consider Maine, but I think it was bigger. But yeah, so they were right there at the epicenter of the New World. Yeah, and they basically they got all snooty and dropped the S and put it a C in front of it. <laughs> it's like yeah, we change our names all the time. So anyway, Leslie, you have quite the fascinating uh, experiences. You're actually a hypnotherapist by trade. You've worked in medical field. Mm -hmm. um, and you have this great connection to extraterrestrials or uh, UFOs and those who experience mm -hmm. or have experienced those types of things. And, and which is fascinating to me because I bumped into those people too. I've seen UFOs. That's about as good as it gets. I haven't mm -hmm. seen, you know, things with five legs walking down the street or, <laughs> or anything like that. It, and I don't know if that's in my path to see them. But I've sure interviewed enough people and by going to UFO uh, conferences, the International UFO Congress in Arizona mm -hmm. and AlienCon in LA and down to McMinnville, uh, Oregon, where I think, is it last weekend or this weekend coming up, they have this huge UFO mm -hmm. um, festival, basically, yes. uh, celebrating a, a, a sighting that happened many, many years ago. And yes. you get lots of speakers <laughs> down there. and. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it, it's, I met some very, very interesting people at those conferences. Now, where did, where did your interest get like heated up to get into that kind of thing? When did, when did the, the specific UFO kind of interest? Of stuff, yeah. Well, it happened many years uh, before, you know, I began working in this area officially. And um, I would say I was always a, I was always a stargazer. I was always, you know, the, the girl was something extra. I, mean, I remember, uh, you know, going to going to mass as a kid. And uh, I asked my my grandma, I said, well, why do some people have halos around their heads when they're praying, but other people don't? And she said, I, you know, I think that's something we better not, you know, talk about any further or publicly because I was seeing people's auras, I have to assume. And I saw a lot, I, I had a lot of very, uh, you know, physical as in through my, you know, ocular centers kind of, of sights, you know, as a spirit encounters, all kinds of things as a kid all the time. And um, when I was, uh, I don't know if you read my bio, but most of my life I was involved in um, uh, the entertainment business, really. Um, I come from a family of entertainers. My my father, the late uh, Gordon Mitchell, was a Emmy, multiple Emmy winning producer, comedy writer who worked for years with Norman Lear. And he produced All in the Family and Good Times and he the Jeffersons. Uh, he created Mork and Mindy for Robin Williams, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, MASH, you name it. He was Mr. Uh, Mr. 70s, 80s there. So we come from kind of an entertainment family. Anyway, I was um, my first 
I would have to call it professional job as an actor. I was hired to go uh, be a company member of a summer stock theater in the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is where the Rushmore heads are, by the way, if you're anyone is unfamiliar. And um, in the company that year was a very interesting gal. Now she seemed fantastically old to me, but she probably was in her late twenties, I'm guessing now. And um, she was a very accomplished uh, singer. She worked all the time in Nevada and, and she had a Mustang ranch. She had no reason to be there. It was kind of, you know, odd, you know, and, and, you know, so I said to her, um, uh, let's just call her Susie because I don't want to reveal her real name. So I said, Susie, what, you know, why, why are you here? I mean, you have your whole thing going. Uh, this is a small summer theater. And, she explained that she was basically hiding out, trying to do a Patty Hearst, trying to, you know, hide out because in Nevada, she also worked for the government in um, non-physical communication, telepathic communication with ETs. And so, you know, Whenever she was called, she would go to the plane wrap airport, get on the plane wrap plane, and they'd take her out, I suppose, to Dreamland or wherever the, the operations were. I know it was underground. She did tell me that it was a massive underground base that no one knew about. Um, and she was tired of doing it. It was exhausting. And the reason was that there was no end of the day for her that because she was so psychic and the ETs could use her as a channel, she was constantly barraged and she could not handle it. So she was hiding out. So at first, you know, I wouldn't say I was skeptical. I'm a very accepting person, but I, but I did, you know, wonder about that, of course. Now, uh, throughout the summer, you know, because she had a car, you know, we, we would go into the town of Custer and every time that we went into town or came back, we were followed by craft and by craft. I mean, most of the time, 70% of the time, it was abnormally agile and quickly moving lights, which is descriptive of you know et craft because the normal rules of gravity do not apply so it was that kind of phenomena or on occasion they were actually close enough where we could detect uh, a shape you know a classic kind of betty and barney hill you know saucer with 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 what appeared to be rotating lights or lights so we occasionally saw that so i i then came to completely believe her after all of these sightings all summer long so one afternoon late in the season, I'm hanging out at the snack bar, which I was very good at, by the way, James. That was my forte. So I was hanging out at the snack bar and um, I happened to see this conspicuous kind of uh, anachronistic black town car pull in. I mean, it, it was this would have been uh 1973 so the car that pulled in was in pristine shape and it looked like a chrysler imperial from maybe 1962 right your classic men in black car so it pulls in and they pull up the car pulls up in front of my friend susie's dorm where she lives now out of the car comes um two beings and I'm calling them beings because in, in retrospect, I've had a lot of time to think about this and what I actually saw. And these individuals had uh, very odd looking skin. First of all, they were dressed like, uh, uh, you know, like a George Raft film from the 40s. They had fedoras on and they had suits with shoulder pads. They were completely anachronistic. And one of the main things I noticed is their skin looked like plastic. I couldn't see hair because the hats were on, but the skin did not look like human skin. And I was only about 20 feet away. And I think it's kind of interesting to note that there were 300 people in the company. And at that moment, I was the only person seeing this, which I find very odd as well on some level. Um, so the other strange thing about these two, um, oddities is that their pants were very high up big high cuffs like high waters and they were wearing shoes that looked 
kind of like orthopedic shoes. They were like kind of big and heavy looking. And, and now in retrospect, I wonder, was there a gravity issue? Is that what was required for these particular beings to motate around? They had to be held down a little bit. I don't know. I can only tell you what I saw. I saw them go into her 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 cabin, her room, and uh, and I thought, okay, I'm going to give this a couple of minutes, and then I'm just going to bust in. Now, you know, I'm 16 years old, no frontal lobe. I don't know what I was going to do, like wave my tuna sandwich at them. I don't know. You know, I, I had no plan, <laughs> but luckily, as I was just ready to head across the street and bust in, they came out and got into their retro town car, uh with the semi fins of 1962 and they peeled out of the theater camp well i went over there immediately and i said well, you know, what was that what the hell was that and she said well that they were just trying to apply pressure to me to work for them again and that's all she would say that's all she ever said about it and that was so close to the end of the season that that was probably the last kind of major unusual event that occurred so uh, you know i from that point on from the age of 16 if i wasn't already i was a complete believer that not only was there extraterrestrial life but that our so-called government was deeply involved in some kind of subversive uh you know continuous uh, all parallel space program that was advanced when meanwhile, you know, a year before we had just gone to the moon in a tin can, basically. So, <laughs> you know, I, I was always open from that moment. And, you know, many years later, um, after I had gone back to school and become a hypnotherapist and all that jazz, um, I was working for a very prestigious clinic and about once a month, uh, someone would call in and they would you know, say, well, I have missing time or I think I had an ET encounter. And no one wanted to touch this kind of thing with a 10 foot pole. And I said, you know, give these people to me. And by that time, I was already uh, certified in past life regression, interlife regression, and I've been doing a lot of regression work. So I wasn't you know, daunted about doing regression uh, for this other purpose. And, and that's really how everything began. And once I saw a few people, um, I, I would have to say, as you would express, that it was a vibrational thing. People just started contacting me. And before too long, um, I was contacted by MUFON, became involved with MUFON, and eventually I became a participant in uh, Kathleen Martin's Experience or Research Project, Good. which is yeah, I under, know Kathleen, she's, she's you know wonderful. Kathy. She's yeah. such a sweetheart, God bless her. So, uh, so it was just onward and upward from there. Now, I still do a lot of what you would call mainstream hypnotherapy. I help people with just about anything you can imagine from stage fright to cigarette smoking to addictions to phobias. I do all that. But my heart, my, my main focus, my I believe my, my purpose here right now is, is to do this kind of work and help these remarkable individuals recover their memories, and then integrate them into their persona so that they can begin to have functional um, lives. And, uh, you know, James, as we, we were discussing before we started recording, we were talking a lot about PTSD, but I must tell you that some of these individuals, especially uh, the ones that have been involved in what we call the secret space program or the parallel space program, they have a very specific type of PTSD. These brave men and women have seen things and experienced things. And something that really gets to me is that they're veterans. They are veterans. They served not just their country, they served our world and came back with psychic scars psychological injuries and it's it's almost like i mean it's almost like these the poor guys that came back from the vietnam war an yeah. unpopular war they were negated they were ignored 
they were allowed to just become drug dependent, non-functional beings, many of them. So that's that's my thing. You know, I, I believe I'm here to not only help experiencers recover their own sanity and their own sense of well-being, but also just to spread the word through media that um, we're not alone. We are not alone. And there are many benevolent beings who are trying to help us, but through our own stubbornness and stupidity, we won't clean up our own backyard. It's our own arrogance. Arrogance, terrible arrogance, xenophobia. Look, you know, James, we can't, we can't even get along with our humanoid neighbors. And, um, you know, as an American, I have a lot of frustration with what I call what goes on below the Mason Dixon line. But um, I'm not going to point any fingers. But what I am going to say is we have a lot of work, I think, to do on our planet that is nobody else's responsibility but ours until we can become valid memory members of, you know, the intergalactic community. Um, you know, we're just not, we're just not ready. We have too much hate and divisiveness going on, you know, and I'm not pointing fingers at any one side, at anyone specifically when I say these things. What I'm saying is we got to sort our out. Oh, yeah, we do. And if we can't sort it out, the earth itself is going to shake some fleas off of its back. That's it. It's and essentially, you know, uh, the messages that I'm getting, you know, the information that I'm hearing from many of these beautiful individuals who work with me are not really different messages from what Betty and Barney Hill heard. You know, clean up your planet. You are toxifying the neighborhood, you know, and and here, you know, only a couple of years ago, we had Trump advocating coal mining again, you know, ah, so, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but Mother Earth, we have to take care of Mother Earth. I think, James, that that planet Earth is a is a unique place um, in the realm of creation, because not only do we have the influence of many species, uh, you know, they talk about the five fingers of man. We don't all look alike. There is a reason for that that is beyond weather conditions. We have had many influences. A lot of panspermia has gone on to create the uh, Homo sapien sapien. And, and so, you know, we, we are the hybrids. We are the ETs. I think the highest form of natural life that occurs on on this orb is is probably something like the Yeti or Sasquatch, a Miocene ape, a humanoid Miocene ape. Otherwise, we were upgraded. So we have a we have a responsibility here. And this is a unique place because not only do we have the diverse ethnicities and types of humans and cultures, but we have a wide range of spiritual development. I mean, I mean, on one end, you know, we've got like Charles Manson, you know, and then on the other end, you know, we've got like the Dalai Lama or, you know, anyone else you would like to put in that position. So this is this is the cruel school. That's what I call it. This is the cruel school. This is where we learn. This is where we learn how to how to generate compassion mm -hmm. and, you know, among other things. So anyway. Well, that so was that good. was my thing. That was my cool. uh, that was my start in this work, and I am I am incredibly committed to it, and it is unbelievably fulfilling. It would be. It's uh, I, I work with Skeeter Wellhouse, who helps do regression uh, in the mm -hmm. missing time, like you do, mm -hmm. and I've been around her at uh, a lot of UFO conferences where experiencers go and they want to literally talk to other experiencers. And I would say this mm -hmm. about Bigfoot conferences. I'd go to one in Kennewick, Washington, and they'd have all the guests there. And it was very interesting speakers, but the, the attendees would go to these conferences at the banquets and they'd sit around and it was the only place they could talk to other people who have experienced the Bigfoot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because their families is like, Oh, granny's, a bit of a loon she saw a big fuzzy thing picking fruit in the back you know it's nine foot beast when she was a kid 
we don't talk to her about that. Well, she can go to the conferences and talk to other people and go, oh yeah, that happened to me too. And that's yeah. what happens at the um, these UFO conferences. And yeah, there's a you know a good part of curiosity. People want to hear the uh, those um, pseudo celebrities that are on whatever alien TV show mm -hmm. and listen to them regurgitate something out of a book they wrote based on a bunch of other people's inf information, but. Well, that sounded kind of negative, didn't it? Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> but the other ones are there because they had experiences and they want to tell somebody about it and vent their experience on a person who actually will receive it without their eyebrows kind of going, hey, you're a bit of a loon because other people have had similar experiences and they, they kind of, it's, it's therapeutic. Yeah, it's therapeutic. They they can actually talk about it and not be criticized for what they believe they had encountered. So it's nice that to have you doing that kind of work too, because it, there is a definite need for it. And there's people out there who experience things that, that are questionable, and at least you could have somebody. You can, you are one of the people they can go to who will listen to them. And be able to tell them, you know, that thing you s saw in the sky you thought was a UFO was actually a plane. And then go, oh, okay, fine. I can get on with my life and not have to worry about it. Or it was what you thought it was. And these are some reasons why this would have occurred in your life as a re as in in different um, mm -hmm. in a different scenario than everyone around you. You you are a bit of a lightning rod for this kind of thing. Like your friend, which was kind of interesting when you start talking about your friend who you said owned a Mustang ranch in Nevada. And I went, mm -hmm. okay, that's the wrong Mustang ranch in Nevada. So, yeah, the wrong one. The, yeah, yeah, actual Mustang. Real Mustang. Actual ranch, yeah. physical okay, but, horses yeah, for but she, riding and running with. And <laughs> so she was kind of a, she was one of those lightning rods for communication. So she yes. was getting a lot of attention and you will yes. bump into more and more of those people yeah, as they come yeah. forward, but may not be able to handle it as well as she did. Well, I think, you know, she, from what I remember, I believe she was a very gifted psychic. I, I wish that I knew and I wish that I had been intelligent enough at that time to ask her how she came to do that work. I mean, how did they find her? How was she approached? But, you know, being an idiot and being 16, I, 16, I, yeah, didn't, yeah. I didn't ask that uh, particular question, which would be very uh, illuminating now. But, you know, James, a lot of I, I, I do want to say, because I just feel you're going to ask this, you tell not everybody who reaches out to me is a genuine experiencer. Correct. Yeah. Um, there, there is a percentage there uh, of, of people who are experiencing uh, a mental health issue of some sort, maybe temporary, maybe prolonged. And, um, you know, my job is to be able to determine that and so before anyone comes to see me uh, either on zoom or, or or physically at my place uh, i i do a pretty thorough intake you know usually about an yeah. hour you know something like Good. that and by the end of that i'm pretty sure of what's going on i'm pretty sure if i'm dealing with the real thing or, or somebody who sadly is suffering from some kind of delusional disorder or what have you now if if a person feels to me to be mentally unwell, uh, you know, I, as a, as a hypnotherapist, as a psychotherapist, I can work with mentally ill people, but as a hypnotherapist, I cannot. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who have had a diagnosis of like schizophrenia or something like that. So um, anyway, what I do is I have um, a number of colleagues, psychologists, psychiatrists, and psychotherapists who are very open to the abduction or the uh, or the contactee phenomena, and in fact, you know, it 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 doesn't matter whether the experience has been traumatic or not. You know, maybe it's possible a person can have a combination of schizophrenia and actually be a real experiencer. But unfortunately, legally, I can't make that determination. But I I don't leave these dear people out there twisting the wind. I immediately refer them to somebody who can legally help them in every possible way. Um, so I would. That's a very small percentage. Maybe. 
less than 5%, I would have yeah. to say, are people who present with, uh, with mental health issues. Most people who come to me, um, I may be what we say, I may be like a last chance Texaco for them uh, in the mental health uh, realm because um, most educated people or, or, or introspective people will first try uh, traditional um, psychotherapeutic methods of dealing with their issue. And when those fail to work and when they are tired of taking the meds, which are causing all kinds of problems, then they will eventually, if they're meant to, they will eventually find me. And, um, and they're oftentimes, these dear people are just so relieved to know that there really is no mental illness here that they have experienced something. They have experienced things that they share with many, many people, as you mentioned, you know, people who go to the conventions or, you know, have experiences like Corey Good or what have you. So it, it, it's a, uh, that would be a, a very common experience for someone to come to me, say in midlife and have dealt with these flashbacks or strange events or missing time or you name it for much of their life. And then at midlife, they say, screw this. I want to find the answer to what's been happening to me. So, uh, you know, also, I believe that there is no such thing as a memory block that lasts forever. And I think most mm -hmm so-called memory blocks, whether they're organic or whether they involve some type of an implant that dissolves, they don't really last much longer than 20 years, even at I, the... I, I interviewed a, a lady and I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't remember her name. She's an author at the, uh, at the 50th anniversary of her encounter and being brought up on a ship. She and her friend uh, had an experience, a police chief had an experience at the 50 year anniversary, the memories all came back. Mm -hmm. And luckily when she was like a little kid, very, very small kid at the time, the police chief was still alive, very mm -hmm. well liked, well respected, very, and it all came back to him too. And he's a part of her book that she wrote, but it, mm -hmm. that memory, uh, suppressed memory, she and her friend were, you know, grew up alcoholics. And I think they had maybe 10 or 15 marriages between them. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it was a horrible. And all of a sudden, at 50 years after the event, all the memories came back. Yeah. It was like their switch got thrown. They had a 50-year block on it. Then the Yeah. Came back oh, in. wow. Well, we see a lot of dysfunction and, and drug use in people with PTSD across the board, whether it happened in Vietnam or whether it happened as a, as a RCMP or whether it happened as an experiencer. And drug use is a big way, drug and alcohol use is a big, yeah. big way that individuals self-medicate and try to cope with these things. So we do see, you know, a lot of that. And then imagine if you're, you know, an individual like uh, Captain Randy Kramer, and you're part of the 20, what we call the 20 and back, where you have served for 20 years, in all kinds of combat situations, and then you are regret regressed through a, a you know, a time, uh, time space uh, fissure. And of course, we've had access to that technology since the 40s, the Montauk chair, etc. So imagine that you're, you've gone through your whole adult life, maybe you've even been married who knows and then you're regressed physically to the age of 17 with a memory block so you're still a mature individual but you have no idea why you feel completely disoriented from your peers from your world for i mean what an idiotic assumption to think that a human being could experience uh, 20 years of a lifetime of activities and events and traumas and you can just put a little beep, a little you know secret space program you know dot on there and that's going to make everything okay so they returned with some of the most significant ptsd that we have ever seen and invariably even and i know randy would talk about this because he has to me and he has on air um a lot of drug use, 
a lot of these these teenagers who these these dear men and women who came back into teenage bodies had an awful lot of dysfunction an awful lot now when you say they came back into teenage bodies mm -hmm. what do you mean by that oh okay well from from what i have heard and not just randy kramer you know um uh Corey Good, Jason Rice, uh, um, you know, a few other of these wonderful people. Um, when you when you finally sign after you're a cadet and you are accepted into the, you know, secret space program and you sign on the dotted line, when you leave on your uh, tour of duty, you leave with three cloned physical bodies. Uh, from that age that you are at that moment. And that is because the surgical and genetic technology is actually so advanced with information that we've gotten from the ETs that, you know, say your arm falls off, you know, or, or your arm is blown off, they can put on a new arm. So the purpose of this is for a large part of your tour of duty, being able to replace or, or fix injuries that are too severe to do it any other way. Now, the final the final clone body is for um, your return. And uh, so I remember I asked Randy, I said, um, well, how does the consciousness, how does the soul, or are they the same thing? I'm not saying they're the same thing. I'm just, how, how does that aspect of what is you that has your em memories, you know, your, your brain, your thoughts, how does that get in to the clone body? And Randy said that there is a kind of cerebral, cere kind of a cerebral fluid that our consciousness as such, although consciousness is really non-local, so it could go anywhere, I guess, but our, our consciousness as such is somehow transferable and it would be taken as a fluid out of the the body that you had been in that you had fought your wars in etc cetera, etc cetera. and then that consciousness is is injected or or transferred somehow into the young clone and it reanimates with your complete consciousness i said well randy how did did, did you did you wake up just saying you know, with how did it feel? Did you just come to consciousness? And he said, well, yes, because this happens before you're returned. So he said he did wake up in this new body and he couldn't believe how young he looked and he kept looking in the mirror and all that. So he woke up as if there was no intermission in his life force or his life journey. And that's what was described to me and then they you know and then they began to work in their diet time dilation or whatever technique they use and they simply return the 20 and back um officers to their 17 year old selves wow so their, their clones are basically just spare parts if they needed spare them. parts and, and that's those, why they take and then three. the one to go back yeah he said two in a spare that's how they, you know, so it's a total of three. And usually, I mean, some of this combat that I've heard described to me is so heavy duty that, you know, officers and, and, and servicemen are women are injured traumatically all the time. It's, uh, it's, you know, but, but Randy Kramer also said, you know, because that right now in our solar system, we pretty much control who comes in in other words we're not really open to some random attack that we're not expecting that that is not the kind of thing that would is our fate really and um that there is there has been an active lunar defense force and an active mars defense force really since the 19 late 1940s you know that's part of the whole truman eisenhower deal so and we can that's a whole nother subject but mm -hmm. yeah so so the bases out there you know are an odd combination of super futuristic techno looking buildings and, 
and and like Quonset huts <laughs> from the 50s in America, you know, like the real low end kind of military yeah. housing. I mean, they brought the same cheap, cheap stuff out there. And so and then um, uh, uh, let's see, Randy has also and other people have also told me that on on Mars specifically, there are um, indigenous um, beings of the reptilian sort that have always lived there that live underground. And yeah. there are also, you know, archaeological uh, artifacts that are everywhere. You know, like, you know, we've seen from afar, of course, you know, the face on Mars, but that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's all kinds of stuff. There are pyramids, there's all kinds of stuff out there. And, you know, of course, the work of um, uh, Zachariah Sitchin, the great um, scholar of um, uh, early um, languages. Um, he has translated the early cylinder scrolls, the Sumer Sumerian cylinder scrolls, and and Mars was a way station for the Anunnaki. They that was one of their that was one of their outposts. They were work mining gold on Earth and shipping it back, and they were living on Mars. And there was some kind of a cataclysm, either organic or a battle cataclysm. Who knows that where the atmosphere of Mars was literally ripped away. So at one time, Mars was a very verdant, uh, water-filled planet very similar to to planet earth it, in your experiences or in, in your talking to these guys who were they fighting they were they were fighting some uh uh there was <laughs> what did he tell me? i'm trying to remember the title because it's very funny okay it's a so randy told me about the battle of phobos that was like a big one. And these were nasty grays, some other Zeta reticulites who were, you know, causing problems. They were still coming to Earth. They were causing problems everywhere they were. And literally, our forces just bombed the bejesus out of them and decimated the entire, uh, you know, that was the last straw. There were other incursions, but what finally happened is uh, I don't know if we nuked them or what the weapons were, but but Randy said that it was the Battle of Phobos. They completely wiped out a very nasty gray civilization that was causing a lot of trouble. Now, I have also heard again from more than one individual that on Mars there have been some really big incursions with aggressive uh, reptilians aggressive reptilians who can use psionics and by that i mean uh they can make them they can project the idea that they have many more soldiers than they do does that make sense they can they yeah. can project illusions by really highly developed uh skills and so these are the kinds of beings that that they're worried about and that they have battled and they're so frightening because of their incredible psionics powers to you know make you see things that aren't there now the what this battle of phobos where did it occur on phobos or what are like... uh, right on phobos which is a moon of ah, okay is it a moon of Mars? Oh God! I, I don't know. I, I I'd have to look. It it's up. a moon. Yeah. It is. So it's a, a planet. Moon? Phobos is a planetoid. A small moon. Um, uh, I think there's Europa and Phobos. So anyway, um, that's what it was in our solar system. In our solar system, a random moon that had been set up as a military base by some particularly nasty uh, greys, zeta reticulites. But there's a lot of greys. Grays have human DNA. There are many varieties, and most of them are benevolent, like the grays that that examined Betty and Barney Hill. They didn't mean to cause trauma like that. They didn't do anything terrible in their minds. Uh, they communicated with her. The leader wanted to give Betty a book to take and keep and have, but it was taken away from her at the last minute. So, you know, there are a lot of different grays, lots of them. Now, the reptilians, I understand, like, this is kind of where you're familiar with the interview of uh, uh, the alleged interview 20 some years ago of a reptilian in Sweden uh, who goes by Lacerta. 
it, you know, oh, God, help me. I'm not aware of that at all, James. It, it's Tell 20, me about that. I know nothing about that. You can actually, if you if you went to the Google net and or actually on YouTube mm -hmm. and you put Lacerta uh, reptilian interview, it's a document uh, in Swedish that had been tr it's translated to English by a computer. Mm -hmm. So it's got that weird computer voice and mm -hmm. the, and because it's going right from Swedish to English via computer, some of the sentence structure is a little bit wonky, but it's, it's, it's a direct translation. And Lacerda is alleged to have been a female reptilian mm -hmm. who was studying humans and she was given permission to give an interview to a fellow in Sweden who then passed that information on to a friend who then comes in and records the interview and writes all the information down. And, and it's very interesting because it is alleged to have happened over 20 years ago. The stuff that she talks about is relevant over the last like five or six years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But she claims that they are the actual Terran race. Mm -hmm. They've lived here. Uh, they've interacted with humans for thousands of years and they are a portion of them are the ones that became gods in egypt they are also the reptiles or the reptilian like uh, the snake in the garden of eden mm -hmm. they are they are referred to in mayan or aztec uh, religious texts as well as egyptian and christian but they're they've been seen for for thousands of years mm -hmm. but they live underground and they live in hives uh, in a number of locations and they are the original terran race so they're there and of course they're all awfully choked that we're screwing up the planet because it's they perceive it as their planet and we are just uh alien bunch of hybrids that mm -hmm. uh are scuttling around on the top here <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting so if anybody out there wants to listen to that interview it's about i guess an hour long or two hours but there's two interviews uh, taken about a year apart from each other and uh there have part of it was actually recorded uh, and it was a uh and oh, that's only going to be released when lacerda or her race says it's okay to release it. Okay. And the interview itself is a shortened version of a very long interview. So it was like you know, the highlights of this interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But whether you perceive it to be real or not, if you listen to the, and the other thing is people won't listen to the entire thing. But if you listen to the full interview, and it's hard to listen to because that weird computer QAnon voice kind of non-human voice, but if you listen to the whole thing, what is being talked about 20 some years ago is really relevant to things that we've only heard lately. Um, they talk about if you, you see alien craft because they have actual, you know, they have spacecraft themselves because they actually come from another, mm -hmm. you know, their history is coming to this planet from another one. So they do have alien craft and there's are the cigar shaped ones. Mm -hmm. So if you see a cigar shaped or sin, 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 that word, uh, the cylinder shaped ones or the cigar shaped ones, those are the reptilian craft. Mm -hmm. And they're just, you know, they have bases under the Arctic, under the Antarctic, under volcanoes, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. they have, she talks about their artificial light sources and stuff. Again, Lacerta, Google that or, or search it on uh, YouTube and you'll get mm -hmm. the audio of the interview. It's, it's, you know, it's a fascinating interview to listen to. And it, it kind of makes you think it's, uh, it's interesting. So they're the ones that are alleged, they allege through this interview that they live underground here, mm -hmm. which connects to a whole bunch of other, we talk, and we're going to get into a little bit of remote viewing, but a remote viewing group out of uh, Concrete, Washington ran into uh, missing people and dealing with reptilians who live underground here. And uh, Skeeter Wellhouse, another uh, person who does what you do uh, mm -hmm. through the regression of uh, people who've had ET contact, has experience rep with reptilians literally showing up saying, we'd rather, 
you didn't do this? Yeah. And I, she's driving from Southern Washington state to Los Angeles and they interfere with her driving from point A to point B. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like it, she's going through areas that aren't on the map and she's like, other than she's very strong and getting through this stuff, they're showing her like detour signs to areas that don't really exist. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. I did a yeah. whole interview Staging. with her talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. More psionic uh, skills. Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah. More psionic skills. You know, I totally, I, I totally think that's very probable. I, I think we have a number of beings that are indigenous to this planet other than us mammalian uh, genetically enhanced uh, creatures here. Be I, I think that, uh, as I said, I think that the Bigfoot, the Yeti, uh, the Yawi, these are also another evolved indigenous form that evolved yes. on this planet. And they right. have special abilities, magical abilities. Now, I know there are a lot of different reptilians and many of them we have, uh, according again to people that I talk to, we have agreements or treaties Exactly, with a yeah. lot of them they're they're allies so you know i i think there's something there's something about us that is just naturally creeped out by the reptilian uh presence you know i think we have a lot of trouble with that which is why you know if they're involved in in i'm not going to say abductions but if they're involved in encounters because many of them are specialists in dna what have you they go to great lengths not to be seen because they don't want to freak us out. But they simply evolved along a slightly more reptilian line than we did. And then, you know, we know that we're a flawed uh, hybrid being. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that, the, that humanoids, Homo sapiens sapiens, we are, um, it's possible that we could experience up to 6,000 different genetic anomalies, dis diseases that are just due to genetic problems. This kind of thing doesn't exist anywhere else in nature. I mean, your dog may get cancer, you know, a weird thing may happen if they're living next to the Love Canal, but, you know, as far as thousands of possible genetic crash and burns, that's our unique, unfortunate legacy of gene tampering. Yeah. And that, that explains, and I was talking to somebody that kind of explains what people refer to as dog man. Yeah. It was just a, a whoops. Oops. And, and now they're yeah. running all over the place. But uh, he was also saying from his information, and again, I, uh, I've interviewed so many people over the years, I can't recall who this fellow is or what the interview where you could find that interview about Dogman. Oh, unless you just Google James Tyson and Dogman, it may pop It'll up. Probably the, um, may pop up. Yeah. But he, he was saying that the uh, Dogman itself was a, uh, they can't breed. Yeah. They, they have like that. Once they're dead, they're gone. Once they're gone, yeah. they're gone. They can't. Yeah. yeah. That, that speed species that group that was created uh mm -hmm. has a, a, a shelf life and it's gone absolutely but in keeping with the rest of the information that i get that infertility among these species where the experiment where anki and his family were experimenting they are all infertile and that was one of the problems with the early hominids too and uh, original sin by the way uh, contrary to what you, I believe that original sin, and this was Zachariah Sitchin's premise as well, is that the Anunnaki, out of frustration, used their own genetic information to solve the infertility problem of their slave species that they had created. And that was such a taboo. And, the, you know, the, the so-called gods, you know, the hierarchy of the Anunnaki were all appalled that this, this had happened. That's original sin. And the snake who came into the garden is a representation of, of, of Enki. And, and the snake, I believe, to be merely a, um, a representation of DNA. And you will see serpents entwined all over Mexico, all over. So I'm not sure in this case, a snake in mythology 
and in the pantheons really means a Red snake. Land. Oh, I'm okay. not oh, sure. oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that. I'm not sure. I think we're dealing with a different, a deeper, a deeper symbology that refers to uh, to genetic uh, uh, tinkering and the genetic represent and the genetic relationship between our progenitors, the Anunnaki, and the early uh, Homo sapiens who turn up overnight. Overnight, yeah. here they are. You know that doesn't happen. That's not a Darwinian possibility. No, and years ago, I, I had an opportunity to interview a very well-known psychic in Western Canada here who, back in, back in like 2015, this happened all over the planet, that the spirit guides that these psychics would communicate to, to get information and tell mm-hmm. you, you know, you're going to be okay or, you, you know, don't take the bus tomorrow. They, their guides took a step back and ETs came in. Yeah. And if you volunteered saying, yeah, okay, the ET can be the guide now and I'll get the information from them. It happened. Mm-hmm. And we got to talk to the ET about basically asking him anything as long as it wasn't a, uh, a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Stuff like that. So I, I said, is, is Bigfoot real? And if so, what is it? Then it came out and said it was the echo E K K O. And it's a, it's a alien being that protects a species on earth that needs to be left alone. So what it was doing is that when we saw the Bigfoot walking across the road and then Mm -hmm. sneaking out from behind the tree, that was shown to us because the real critter, the Bigfoot, the Sasquatch was booking it on the other direction. Mm -hmm. And this thing was going like, Hey, look over here. Yeah. And it ran around the tree. It was gone. Taking you like, out. Yeah. It's, oh my God, it's disappeared into thin air. Yeah. So Bigfoot must be a shape shifting, blah, blah, yep. blah. Well, yep. No, Bigfoot isn't that much of a shape. Bigfoot is an actual critter. Yeah. That, a crafty it, critter. It's <laughs> to be left alone because it's our quote unquote original DNA. Yes. So they it's have our be left original alone. DNA. Yes. They are the preservers of our original DNA. DNA, we we are, they are our cousins, if, if so you will. It's, it's the echo, this mm-hmm. being that protects them from us. Mm-hmm. So it's out there doing one of these. Yeah. And But, you know, sometimes we'll stumble upon the real ones and sometimes we won't. But it's the, it's the echo's job to, they're assigned to various families that are close to human contact. Yes. And uh, so that was very interesting. If again, taking that, if you believe that, but I do. In, yeah. taking it in, it was, and that was like, again, 2015 uh, when we got that information and it was, it was fascinating. We talked about all sorts of other woo woo stuff, but mm-hmm. uh, that one always stuck with me, this echo. And then you look at a place like the, the Skinwalker ranch, which is mm-hmm. now popular mm-hmm. and all this stuff. And the stories that it, it happened there many, many years ago of, of these kind of, portal beams of light where a Bigfoot comes down and hits the ground, gets up, dusts himself off and walks off into the distance and disappears. Mm-hmm. And okay, there's an echo showing up and yeah. going off to do his work or whatever. It was just an area. And uh, yeah, that's a whole other bizarre thing that maybe we should Oh man, the skinwalker topic is, is very huge, but I will just say this. Um, I believe a lot of what is going on there has to do with our own actions and that there is a subterranean base of some sort there. Oh yeah. Uh, there have been too many uh, people have witnessed sides of the mountain opening up, craft coming out, craft coming in. I, I don't think it's heavily ET. I think it's a cooperative base like uh, like Rendlesham for the British and the Americans. I think it's yeah. a cooperative brace base. I also think there's something like that going on up at Mount Shasta too and and several other places. So yeah, that, yeah. that the the Skinwalker Ranch talking to a psychic um, Elizabeth Hansey, she she actually did some remote viewing on there and and, and targeted a couple of the people in the TV series. Mm-hmm. And one of them, she says, has a really dark energy around him. Mm-hmm. Uh, his his natural psychic ability, his intuitiveness has been, uh, whether he's done shut it himself, down. been shut down, and he's just a blank face. Yep. 
And some of the beings out there are reptilian, some are drac drag dragon, draconian. Very draconian, very Dra possibly. Yeah, so yep. she said there's them. And it's funny that this guy uh on the TV show, he goes by he, it's not his real name. He goes by the name Dragon. Yeah, I know and, the I know the guy. And he gets mean. really upset when people talk about digging holes. Ooh, he hates it. Oh yeah. no, no, no. We can't dig a hole. Oh nope, my god, nope. no. No, no, terrible things people happen. Will, <laughs> people will get sick. And I've always said, and this is my police brain going, so this one guy always gets sick when you dig a hole. Yeah. Tell you what, ask him to go to town while we're digging a hole. Yeah. See, see what him. happens it's then. It's solved. Let's no, like, he's got him. a weird. He's Get got a debating. weird agenda. He's left over from um, uh, what's his name's regime. Uh, the uh, eccentric yeah. multimillionaire who had owned a, the whole place. Yeah. Oh, why can't I remember his name? You know Bob. exactly who I Bob. mean, Bob. And he's left over from that regime. But he's so, very. He, and and in hindsight, I'm uh, not hindsight, but we were looking at the other day, going, "Holy crap!" Yeah, he he is there for one reason, and it's to keep people from look like and and i i'm looking at it now every time one and i watch the series every time someone says i think next time we're going to go over to this area and if dragon goes that's a really good idea then it's <laughs> like you, you know you're not going to get anything you're not going to it's like diversion 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 and, <laughs> and, and bless him he, and bless him he's human and probably has no idea he's doing this but i know he picked up this very dark energy around yeah. him which is maybe influencing him yeah to go that way and well oh, he's always really, got the weapons right he's always yeah. carrying an mk40 or something yeah, he's always got like a weapon like yeah. he's uh you know in afghanistan or something yeah I we're gonna know, but... you know if, if a 17 foot skinwalker pops out of the ground that is a wolf i'm gonna shoot it even though in history <laughs> everybody who shot at one of those things it doesn't affect them so yeah. what's the gun for other than to make yeah. good tv to people yeah. who think you need yeah. guns in well, he's a scary guy he thinks um i think he thinks uh he's paranoid too he's a weird dude but anyway yeah. um but any, yeah that, anyway you've got this book we'll talk yes. about intersections a true story of et in uh, contact yes uh, intersections a true story of extraterrestrial contact you can get that on the amazons yes. amazon will bring it to you uh if you go to your facebook page our contact tv yes our contact tv on facebook mm -hmm. uh you could probably get the book through a link in there too which i recommend yep. because that way you get the money and amazon doesn't <laughs> uh bless amazon though they they're they they're, they get stuff to you it's just that it's um a tad pricey or not pricey but the authors of the books don't really get anything from them intersections a true story of extraterrestrial contact take me a novice at extraterrestrial contact um in in your writing when you guys wrote that book uh can you point, give us a couple of stories on some of the most unique ones that you found really really interesting well this is the the book is really about the journey of one man wes roberts who was a college professor he still is and he came to me in midlife with fragmented memories terrible insomnia missing time uh you name it you know he had it going on so it's really the journey that he went on from the first time he saw me where he finally understood that his fragmented memories were about real experiences that happened on on a level that affected him deeply and we regressed him to uh you know his earliest experiences which happened probably when he was about three um and it and it took him and and the book takes him up more or less to the to the present day where he has integrated his experiences and what he has learned from them and such but there have been all kinds of um amazing things that happened with him one uh, one um one little story i think we probably have time maybe for one story i have a unfortunately i have to therapize and not too long from now but um we have um uh he had been taken many times it, taken uh by beings who were not grays they were very tall 
very slender and so skinny and slender that it was almost hard to tell if they were male or female. They did have male and female energies, but they were very tall and very slender. And these were the beings that were connecting with him. Um, so he was taken um, and he was about age 12, something like that. And it always sort of started out the same way. It happened at night in his room. And it may be, I'd have to refresh my memory, but it may be that greys were the ones who actually transported him. Because I think greys a lot of the time are, are really cybernetic beings. They're not fully physical. They're more drone-like. You can't get a lot of thoughts out of them. So anyway, the, the greys came down, they levitated him through his roof or the wall or whatever it was. And he found himself at um, a, you know, what we call these screen memories or staged events. It, he was sitting in a, in a room that was supposed to be like a kid's birthday party, which was very strange. And he said the house was old. It looked kind of like his grandmother's house or something. And all the kids were, were seated in a, in a circle. And he said some of the children were completely unconscious. They were just out. They were just turned off. They were out. And some of the kids he recognized because of the, apparently the many times they had been together when they had been on these adventures, excursions, or whatever you wish to call them. So um, at a certain point, it kind of became clear that this was about, really about some type of physical examination, not a painful, nothing painful or traumatic, just measuring, looking, whatever, uh, because the kids kept going into this other room. So finally, um, a being came out of this other room and he was wearing a white coat like a doctor and had a stethoscope and he had a big clown mask on. Now this was terrifying to most of the kids that were conscious. You know, I don't think, you know, the ETs, when they use screen memories, they're often imperfect. They had no idea about onophobia, the fear of clowns. It's one of the top phobias that people have. So all the kids started freaking out and Wes, you know, like grabbed a table and overturned a table and started yelling, what the, and before he knew it within like five or six seconds, Bam! He landed back down in his bed as if he'd been thrown into it. <laughs> so he foiled with his 12 year old, um, uh, you know, uh, snarkiness. He kind of foiled this whole thing that was supposed to be a very comfortable little physical checkup and he ruined it and he did it on purpose and they and they threw him back in his bed. Nice. So if you are being taken somewhere, just start yelling and screaming and be afraid. Like Sometimes the, it'll work. <laughs> no, no, please relax. We're all clowns. We just yeah. want to poke at you. <laughs> We're clowns and want to poke you. Oh, yes. my God. That John is, Wayne that... Gacy friggin' <laughs> now. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> all I see in my mind, uh, I, it's funny, when he told me that story, all I could see was John Wayne Gacy. Yeah, as a clown. That's all I could see. But yeah, it was terrifying to all the kids. And John Wayne Gacy was a long way off from doing anything at that point. But it was a scary thing. And uh, but screen memories, uh, creating artificial environments. Uh, this is which is psionics again, projecting. This is a big part of what the children experience in their early uh, encounters. Nice. Yeah, we could. I be, I wanted to talk uh, a bit about the your remote viewing and uh, how to do that too, but I can see how we can that will take another hour and you don't have that oh, much time left. I'm so sorry, it's I've okay. done my best. I know you did well, and and, and and I actually almost didn't interrupt you, but I can't help it. I just interrupt <laughs> all the time and tell stories. But well, uh, for people who are interested in the book and want to know more about Wes Roberts and his. Uh, his experiences with uh, ET contact um, over and above the clowns. Over and they, above. Yeah, over and it, above. It, they did come back a few times. Um, <laughs> well, we send in the clowns, you know, that and, and, send in, and send in the clones either way. Send in the clones. Either one, the clone <laughs> clowns. Intersections, a true story of extraterrestrial contact. Uh, you can, again, uh, Google that. 
uh, Intersections, a true story of extraterrestrial contact. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Go to um, Leslie's Facebook page, Our Contact TV. And actually, yeah, sign up, follow them there, like them there, however that's set up. Our Contact TV. And you can actually get the book through there, which would help if you're interested. And uh, and at least Leslie can and pay her phone bill uh, <laughs> without having to wait for the Amazons to send uh, the 35 cents they get for every book. Sure, that's right. My milk money. <laughs> so, again, thank you very much. That was very interesting, especially about that whole space for not space force my god um, well no but we can i mean we could really go into that much more deeply and and let's let's do that next time i'd love to come back and visit with you anytime you'll have me okay t- uh, in about an hour <laughs> uh yeah we'll, we have to do that okay again, uh leslie mitchell clark you can find her oh oh good lord your website is for the the sub I was going to say the subconscious ones. <laughs> you Put know what I mean. Subconscious. Lightworkhypnosis.com. Lightwork, all one word, hypnosis.com. And if you email me, I do respond. I really do, James. If anyone uh, has a question or feels that they might have experienced something of high strangeness or you just want to share, I, I please reach out to me, Leslie, L-E-S-L-E-Y, at lightworkhypnosis.com. It may take me a minute to get back to you, but I promise that I will. Excellent. Thank you again, and thanks for dropping by, and I'll get back to you, and we'll set one of these meetings up again. Thank you, James, and bless you for all that you do to open people's minds. It's been great. Thank you. That's it. Let's roll. Hey, let's be careful out here. I see.